Please turn to Genesis chapter 47. We're going to read verses 13 through 31. It says, Now there was no bread in all the land, for the famine was very severe, so that the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan languished because of the famine. And Joseph gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, for the grain which they brought, which they bought. And Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. So when the money fell in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came to Joseph and said, Give us bread, for why should we die in your presence? for the money has failed. Then Joseph said, give your livestock and I'll give you bread for your livestock if the money is gone. So they brought their livestock to Joseph and Joseph gave them bread in exchange for the horses, the flocks, the cattle of the herds and for the donkeys. Thus he fed them with bread in exchange for all their livestock that year. When that year had ended, they came to him the next year and said to him, we will not hide from my Lord that our money is gone. My Lord also has our herds of livestock. There is nothing left in the sight of my Lord but our bodies and our lands. Why should we die before your eyes, both we and our land? Buy us and our land for bread, and we and our land will be servants of Pharaoh. Give us seed that we may live and not die, that the land may not be desolate. Then Joseph brought all the land of then Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh, for every man of the Egyptians sold his field because the famine was severe upon them. So the land became Pharaoh's, and as for the people, he moved them into the cities from one end of the borders of Egypt to the other end. Only the land of the priests he did not buy, for the priests had rations allotted to them by Pharaoh, and they ate their rations which Pharaoh gave them. Therefore they did not sell their lands. Then Joseph said to the people, Indeed I have bought you and your land this day for Pharaoh. Look, here is seed for you and you shall sow the land. And it shall come to pass in the harvest that you shall give one-fifth to Pharaoh, four-fifths shall be your own, as seed for the field, and for your food, for those of your households, and as, for, and as food for your little ones. So they said, You have saved our lives. Let us find favor in the sight of my Lord, and we will be Pharaoh's servants. And Joseph made it a law over the land of Egypt to this day that Pharaoh should have one-fifth except for the land of the priests only, which did not become Pharaoh's. So Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt, in the country of Goshen, and they had possessions there and grew and multiplied exceedingly. And Jacob lived in the land of Egypt seventeen years. So the length of Jacob's life was one hundred and forty-seven years. When the time drew near that Israel must die, he called his son Joseph and said to him, Now if I have found favor in your sight, please put your hand under my thigh, and deal kindly and truly with me. Please do not bury me in Egypt, but let me lie with my fathers. You shall carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burial place. And he said, I'll do as you have said. Then he said, Swear to me, and he swore to him. So Israel bowed himself on the head of the bed. Let's, let's pray one more time. Lord God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this opportunity we have to look into your word again. Thank you for this book of Genesis, the book of Beginnings. Lord, we pray that you would teach us, help us to learn this morning, help us to see how good you are to your people as our Heavenly Father, how you take care of us, how you love us, how you care for us. And Lord, we do pray for those in this place who don't know you, that you would save them and save them through Jesus Christ alone, for he is the only means we have of salvation. For those who are here, we pray that you would encourage us in our faith, in our walks with you. Pray that you would grow us and, and feed us and nourish us pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're continuing to look at the life of Joseph here. And we're looking at how Joseph deals with the famine. How Joseph takes care of the Egyptians at this time. He saved the lives of the Egyptians. He saved the lives of, of his family during this famine. And this was a very long famine. How long was it? Seven years long. It was a very long time for them to be without food. For them to to not endure past this famine. And they would, not, they would not have made it if God didn't give Pharaoh the dreams, if God didn't give 
Joseph the interpretations to the dreams, the Egyptians would not have made it past this famine. So we're going to look at how Joseph dealt with the famine. We're going to consider if Joseph was too hard on the Egyptians during this time. We'll make some applications about this famine or about what, what Joseph did here. And we're going to see a distinction between Israel and Egypt, between the people of God and, and the people of the world. So let's begin looking at the famine, starting in verse 13. Verse 13 says, Now there was no bread in all the land, for the famine was very severe, so that the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan languished because of the famine. So we're told right there that this famine is very severe. When we read about a famine in the scriptures, we don't need to be told that it was very severe for us to realize a famine is something that was serious. People didn't survive famines. A lot of people died through famines. And when we read about famines in the scriptures, we see famines often, I would think, over a period of probably about 4,000 years in the Old Testament times. We see Abraham going through a famine. We see Isaac going through a famine. We see this famine here that Jacob or Israel and, and Joseph went through. Famines are mentioned in the book of Ruth. In David's time, there was a famine. In, in um, Elijah's time, there was a famine. And when I read the scriptures, I read the scriptures because I want to learn what I'm reading. I don't want to just read it and, and having done read it and, and that's that I go on with my day. I want to really understand what I'm reading. I want to be able to, to take it in and, and learn it. I want to learn from the scriptures and I want to apply it to my life. I think that's what we all need to do when we read the scriptures. But when we read about famines, we have to understand that we don't know anything about this. I don't think any of us here have experienced anything like not having food, uh, not, not having water, almost going to die because you, because you don't have the things that you need. We have all the things that we need that Jesus spoke about in the Sermon on the Mount. We have food and water, clothing, we have shelter. And it's always been that way for me. I think that's, it's always been that way for all of us. I think the closest we ever got to something like this was during COVID, right after COVID, when, uh, when it was hard to buy toilet paper, when it was hard to buy milk. Um, you, you heard that. You, we saw pictures on social media about shelves being empty, no eggs on the shelves. And, and, and you know, we were thinking, oh, no, are we going to run out of food here in the U.S.? But I never went without. Maybe I had to leave early to go buy a couple of gallons of milk from the gas station. I remember a few times. Just a minor inconvenience at most. But we don't know anything about a famine like what people went through in times past. We're, we're very protected from these things. We're very comfortable. So I, I think that should affect us when we read the scriptures as we're trying to apply them to our lives and trying to follow the Lord, it, trying to follow, follow the Lord in our lives. When we look at this chapter, this was a difficult time for these people. A very difficult time. We read about a famine in Samaria in 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 24 through 33. And in that famine, it talks about a donkey's head being sold for a lot of money. You think this donkey's head shouldn't be valued at that much money, but people were using it for whatever meat they could. We even read about dove's dung being sold for a lot of money. That's how hungry they were. They were willing to eat anything that they could to survive. So about this famine here, we're told that it was very severe. We're told that the lands of Egypt and the lands of Canaan languished under <clears throat> the famine. To languish means that, that it, the land would, lost its health, it lost its vitality. It wasted away. The Webster's Dictionary describes this as it loses its vegetating power. It means that the land was dead. The land was dead and there was no hope for any kind of harvest. There was no hope for any kind of, any kind of bread. There, there was no hope for food. And that was what this famine was like. In Genesis chapter 45 and verse 11, Joseph tells his brothers that there is still five years left of this famine. And when we get to see this chapter here in this, see the famine here in this chapter, it says that they were already out of money. They're out of money and, and they're entering this chapter. At least five years left of the famine. The thing about this famine was it lasted a very long time. Verse 15 says, all the money had failed in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan. So we're going to see in this chapter how Joseph dealt with this famine, how he took care of the people, and how he got the, the, the Egyptians to survive past the famine. Look there in verse 14. 
It says, And Joseph gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan for the grain which they bought. And Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. So Joseph, during those seven prosperous years, he was gathering up all this grain. He was gathering up all the grain, and then when those years were gone, and now they're in the famine, he started to sell the grain. Well, the people ran out of all their money because they had no way to survive other than the grain that Joseph had gathered. When Joseph had these interpretations about the dreams that Pharaoh had, Joseph believed what the Lord had shown him. And that's simply the way it is with a believer. That's what a believer is. Joseph saw what the Lord had showed him, and he structured his life according to that. And that's what a believer is. If we think about, if we ask this question, what is a believer? Sometimes we can overcomplicate things. If we ask this question, what is a believer? It's simply to read what God tells us in the scriptures. In Joseph's case, he had this interpretation of a dream. And to structure our lives according to that. What God says to do, we do. What God says not to do, we don't do. In, in ways that God directs us personally, we, we follow those ways. And that's what Joseph did. He believed God. He believed this, these interpretations, which were really far out there. Seven years of prosperity and then seven years of famine. He believed them and he applied them to his life. And he applied them to the lives of the people. And when Joseph did this, he, this famine lasted so long, it was seven years long, that he was raking in all the money in Israel, not Israel, all the money in Canaan and all the money in Egypt, raking all this money to where the people were without money because he was selling the grain. So we see that Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. Joseph wasn't getting rich off of this famine. That's what leaders tend to do sometimes, crooked leaders. They'll get rich off of the needs of the poor. They'll get rich off of the needs of other people. He wasn't getting rich. He wasn't keeping a little bit of profit from each of the people that were in need here. It says that he brought the money into Pharaoh's house. Joseph was a steward. He was a steward. The, the, the money wasn't his. The grain wasn't his. The money was Pharaoh's. So all of the money that came in from selling the grain wasn't his either. It was Pharaoh's. Even the interpretation that Joseph had of the dreams, they weren't his interpretations. God had given him those interpretations. They were God's interpretations. Even his ability to take care of the people during the time of the famine, that wasn't what he had in himself innately. It was all given to him by the Lord. So everything he had was given to him. He was a steward to, in an earthy way to Pharaoh. And in a true way, he was a steward to the Lord. And he realized this, so he didn't use that time to take advantage of the people. He brought in all this money. He brought it to Pharaoh's house. The Lord gave Joseph all of the wisdom he had. It says in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 9, A man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. So there in verse 15, it says, When the money failed in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came to Joseph and said, Give us bread, for why should we die in your presence? For the money has failed. The Egyptians had no more money, but the problem was they were still hungry. And they asked this question. This question should stand out to each of us. This question is asked here in verse 15, and it's also asked in verse 19. Why should we die in your presence? Give us bread, for why should we die in your presence? For the money has failed. In verse 19, why should we die before your eyes, both we and our land? And this question should really disturb our complacency as, as believers, as Christians. There's always going to be people who are needy. There's always going to be people who are perishing. But should those needy people continue to be needy? Should they continue to perish? And we can look at this physically. We can look at this spiritually as well. Should they perish when they are in our presence? Is there a responsibility that we have for those around us? How responsible are we for the needy when we are able to help them? And that's, that's the issue. If we're able to help and there is a needy person, how responsible are we to help them? Well, Jesus answered this in the parable of the Good Samaritan when he, when he described who our neighbor is, who is our neighbor who we should help. 
It's any person that we come across who has a need and we are able to help them. This is what it is to love your neighbor as yourself. And I think here we could say because of this principle, this biblical principle that God has given to us, yes, Joseph was responsible to take care of them because he had grain. He was able to help them and they had a need. Well, that's why he was there, right? Of course, that's why he was in that place. But he had, he had a responsibility to help these people in need. We're going to look at how he helped them, and we are looking at how he helped them. But the fact is, he needed to help them, and he did. So look at Joseph's response to the Egyptians' request there in verse 16. Joseph told them, give your livestock, and I'll give you bread for your livestock if the money is gone. In verse 17, it says they brought their livestock to Joseph, and Joseph gave them bread in exchange for their horses, the flocks, the cattle of the herds, and for the donkeys. Thus he fed them with bread in exchange for all their livestock that year. So their livestock got them, got them through another year of the famine. They survived that year. They're still alive. The problem is the famine is still going on, a very long famine, and they're hungry again. Now they are without money, and they're also, out, also without their livestock. There in verse 19, why should we die before your eyes, both we and our land, buy us and our land for bread? And we and our land will be servants of Pharaoh. Give us seed that we may live and not die, that the land may not be desolate. And the verses 20 and 21 says, Then Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh, for every man of the Egyptians sowed his field, because the famine was severe upon them. So the land became Pharaoh's. And as for the people, he moved them into the cities from one end of the borders of Egypt to the other. So they use their money, they use their livestock, they use their land, and now they are Pharaoh's servants. They sold themselves into slavery. They are moved into cities from one end of Egypt to the other, probably to be better taken care of by Joseph as he's administrating this, and probably also to better take care of the land because they're thinking about their future. They're thinking about the future of Egypt, the future of these Egyptian people. They had no more earthly possessions, but they were still alive. And they had hope to make it past this famine. And they already knew how long the famine would last. God in his grace, God's kindness, told these pagan people how long it would last. It was going to be a seven-year-long famine. So they were, they were tracking with this. They were, they're, they're trusting that this Joseph character was going to get them past the famine, of course, Joseph, we know he was trusting in God. Then we read in our text in verse 22, Only the land of the priests he did not buy, for the priests had rations allotted to them by Pharaoh. So these priests weren't hungry. They were, they were not hungry. They had rations already. They had a very modest living. They were taken care of by Pharaoh. But now that everyone else who's wealthier than them is running out of everything that they have, well, now the priests are okay and they don't need to sell their land. They're not hungry. They're making it through the famine okay. And we see this here. This pagan man, Pharaoh, took care of his pagan priests, and this should be a lesson to us. It is a biblical principle. Godly men and godly women are responsible to take care of those who are in Christian ministry, those who give themselves full time in whatever form they're in ministry. There's, there's a text in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17 and 18. It says, Let the elders... Who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. Then it says, For the scripture says, You shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. So we know this, but it's interesting to, to see here that even, even in Egypt during that time, those pagan religious leaders were taken care of by Pharaoh. So we see Joseph's final act to get these people through the famine. It's there in verses 23 and 24. It says, And Joseph said to the people, Indeed, I have bought you and your land this day for Pharaoh. Look, here is seed for you, and you shall sow the land, and it shall come to pass in the harvest that you shall give one-fifth to Pharaoh, four-fifths shall be your own as seed for the field, and for your food for those of your households, and as for food for your little ones. So these people actually sold everything that they had, including, them, including themselves, 
in order to survive. They're, they're put into this form of slavery, but this wasn't harsh servitude like what we hear that we, we've had in this country and in other countries where people are, are stolen from their land against their will. These people actually asked by us because they realized it, it was the last thing that they could do in order to survive the famine. They were out of everything that they had. All the means of survival was gone. So they asked Joseph, buy us and our land. They're basically trusting in Joseph, trusting in Pharaoh because they had no other way to survive. But slavery today is different. Slavery, slavery today, what will, well, in times past, right? It still goes on today in certain places. But it's different when people are stolen from their land against their will, when they have their their wives stolen from them, their children stolen from them, when people are abused and taken advantage of, and people are forced to work in harsh conditions, and people are not cared for. This was different. They sold themselves to Pharaoh, and now there was a godly man in charge who administrated all of this. Godly Joseph was now responsible to take care of them. He was responsible to get them past this seven-year-long famine. He took care of them. Them selling themselves to Joseph or selling themselves to, to Pharaoh didn't mean that they were Joseph's for him to use them and abuse them. It meant that they were now Joseph's in order for him to be responsible for them and take care of them and truly ensure that they made it past this famine. Again, we, we can't imagine what this was like. We, 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 we read it in the scriptures. We've read it in history. We can understand it to a sense, but we can't imagine what this was like where you're willing to relinquish all of your freedoms and say, buy me in order be, because they, they didn't do this because they were thinking, well, buy us. We're going to die anyway. So buy us. Well, we might as well be miserable <laughs> while, while we die. No, they, they did this as their last attempt to survive. They were entrusting themselves to Pharaoh. And it worked. It worked for them. Joseph was now a steward over them and he took care of them. Now we, we see here that this wasn't a land grab. This wasn't a seizure of land. Remember again, they asked for this. The, the religious leaders, they didn't have to sell their land because they weren't in the same need that the other Egyptians were in. These people agreed to it. Their lives were saved. They ended up making it past the famine because of this final act of selling themselves, basically. And there's really a, a, a principle here in the same way that we can think about these Egyptians as they're going through this famine. They're out of food, so, so, so they, they sell or they, they, buy, they buy up all the food that they can. Then they run out of money. But the famine is still going on. They realize they can't take care of themselves. Next thing you know, they look at whatever means they have, whatever resources they have. Okay, here we have our livestock. They sell their livestock in order to get grain. But they're still in need. There's still a famine. And the land and, and, and themselves, their, their, their freedom is put together. But we could say then they sell their land because they have no other means of survival. And, and they get some food and they continue on. But the famine is still going on. Finally, they sell themselves. And that's the way it is with us in a spiritual sense. Many people can testify to this. As long as you don't think you need the Lord, you're okay where you're at. I used to think that way. Well, Jesus will always be there. Maybe I'll surrender my life to Jesus when I'm an old man and I've lived the way I wanted to live all my life. We go along with, through life as long as we think that everything's okay. As long as we think, I don't need him right now. And that's the way it was for them in a physical sense. As long as they could survive, they were fine with having their freedom. But when they realized they were without any hope of survival, that's when they said, buy us. We have no earthly hope. They placed all of their hope in Pharaoh under the oversight of Joseph. And that's the way it is for us. We must come to a place where we realize, spiritually speaking, we are condemned. We are under the wrath of God. And there is no way we can avoid God's wrath. There is no hope we have. You know, all these troubles we have in this world, sickness, disease, death, all this misery, misery we have, it's all just an effect of the fact that we're not right with God as a people. 
It's the effects of sin. And eventually we need to get to a place where we realize, Lord God in heaven, I can't do it on my own. Buy me. I surrender myself to you. And Jesus comes and he says, what, is he, what, what did he say? Repent and believe. Follow me. We follow him. And like Joseph what, did not abuse the people, he did not take advantage of them. Yes, he moved them from city to city. Yes, he, he oversaw their uh, taking care of them. He oversaw how they would take care of Egypt. Yes, if we come to Christ, we do need to obey him. We do need to follow him. We do need to obey his will. When we read in the scriptures to live a certain way, we need to live that certain way. But he cares for us. He takes care of us. He gets us through this life. He gets us through condemnation. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And we find out that we are under his care, even though he bought us, even though we are not our own. We belong to him. And for those who have done that, we realize that what it says in Romans 6 is true of them. It says, for when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. That's how we were before Christ. We we're slaves of sin. What fruit did you have then in the things in which you are now ashamed? It asks rhetorically. <clears throat> for the end of those things is death. But now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. We're no longer free from righteousness the way we were before Christ. We were slaves then. We're slaves today. Now, now we're no longer slaves of sin. We're slaves of God. But our fruit leads to holiness and its end is the everlasting life. So we're either slaves of sin or slaves of, of God. Which is it going to be for us? Well, these Egyptians were moved to other locations. And then it says that they were given seed. And they were responsible to farm and cultivate the land for Pharaoh. And they were allowed to keep 80% of it. They were allowed to keep 80% of the harvest. And that was really good incentive for them. It was good incentive for them and for their families. But they had to give 20% to Pharaoh. No, this was not a tax. At first, it was not a tax. A tax is something that's, that's demanded of you to give because you buy or because you live in a certain place. It's a forced contribution. This was not a forced contribution. The 20% wasn't forced upon them because it, the, the seed that they were given was not their own. It was given to them. Remember, they didn't have anything anymore. Remember, they, they sold everything they had. They, they didn't even have any freedom anymore. They had no livestock, no land, no money. They were given this by Pharaoh to farm. Now they were being told what they needed to do. They were given seed. They told you farm this, you, you sow it, you cultivate it. And you get to keep 20%. Is that what they were told? They didn't get to keep 20. They got to keep 80%. This was a huge incentive for them to get past this famine. For them to recover and to recuperate. And it says it's for the land, for you, for for. For your, for your family. So it's also for the land. So, so these Egyptians, so Joseph, under the oversight of Pharaoh, is thinking about how to help these Egyptians get past the famine, how to help the nation of Egypt get past this famine. And they had to give 20% to Pharaoh. Then we read there in verse 26, it says, Joseph made it a law over the land of Egypt to this day that Pharaoh should have one-fifth except for the land of the priests only, which did not become Pharaoh. So it continued on year after year from there. Even when they got past the famine, they still had to give 20%. That could be viewed as a tax. A 20% tax to Pharaoh continued after the famine. This year that Joseph did in taking care of these Egyptians, this was the greatest task of his life. This was a, the greatest thing that he was called to by the Lord. And it was really his most difficult one. Success always brings opposition. It's always going to bring opposition. So he would have seen that. We're not told about it, but I'm almost certain he experienced opposition when he was in Potiphar's house as quickly as he was rising to the top. I'm sure all the other slaves were jealous of him. Why him and not me? I'm just as able as he is. As he is. Why is he getting all this favoritism from Potiphar? He would have experienced much opposition when he was in Potiphar's house, he would have experienced much opposition when he was second in command there in Egypt to the Pharaoh. So he experienced opposition. This was his 
greatest tasks that he was responsible to do. He, he had to make decisions that meant life or death for the Egyptians. Now that's a great task. Maybe for some narcissist who doesn't care about others, it's not a great task because he doesn't care about others. But we know from what we see in the life of Joseph, he cared about the people. So he saw how serious this was, how, how great of a responsibility he had to these people. And I would say, in the life of Joseph, in all the things that we've seen, this was his greatest task that he had. When people think about Joseph, what is it that they think about? When, when people think, when people bring up, so tell me about this Bible character, Joseph. This Joseph in, in the book of Genesis. What do you know about him? What is, what is it that people think about Joseph? What do you, Father's favorite, the code. Yeah, the code of many colors. That's, that's popular. Father's favoritism. His abuse by his brothers, yeah. And Potiphar's house. Strong, strong man. He, he, he resisted temptation. And yeah, that's, that's, that's important. All of these things are what people think about when they think about Joseph. When they have an image of Joseph. But him being the deliverer of Egypt. Him being the savior of these Egyptians in an earthly sense. Getting them through this famine. Is that a type of Christ, yeah. He's a type of Christ right here. And throughout his life, we saw so many times where he's a type of Christ. I'd say this was the greatest task that Joseph had. He got them through, through the famine. Being called Joseph the Deliverer, these Egyptians would have had no problem with that title when post-famine, right? When they got past the famine, they, they would have been so thankful to Joseph for, for what happened. He saved their lives. And as a type of Christ, as he saved their lives physically, Jesus Christ saves our lives spiritually. Let's answer this question. Was Joseph too hard on the Egyptians? This was pretty, was pretty serious. They had nothing during the famine. Was Joseph too hard on the Egyptians? After the, uh, throughout the Towards, uh, I guess we would say, the last few years of the famine, they were now Pharaoh's servants. They had no more land, no more money. They were barely making it through. They had to relinquish all their money, their livestock, their land, and their freedom. So was his treatment of these Egyptians too extreme? I, I think if we consider the fact that this was a seven-year-long famine, this Time was a very extreme time for these Egyptians. We can let the Egyptians themselves answer this question. Was Joseph too hard on these Egyptians? What do they say there in verse 25? You have saved our lives. I don't think they thought he was too hard. I don't think they were embittered to Joseph as the administrator of all of this. You have saved our lives. Let us find favor in the sight of my Lord and we will be Pharaoh's servants. No, Joseph was not too hard on these Egyptians. He saved their lives. And that's what mattered. So let's attempt to make some applications of this, of this text. Now, when we, when we try to do this, we need to realize this text is not prescriptive, it's descriptive, right? That's a good way to, to, to look at this text. It doesn't tell us exactly how we need to react and what we need to do in our particular areas of our lives. But it does describe to us what happened to these Egyptians and these Canaanites, what they went through, and how God appointed Joseph in order to get them past the famine. And I think there's some application we can make. So we do see that this is a rare event. We need to understand that, first of all, this is a very rare event. This is a pagan government caring for the needy. So we say, okay, well, that's our country. But no, not just that. It is a pagan government caring for the needy in a famine. That's not our country. And it's, we have a rare occurrence here of a believer appointed to oversee this. So that's, that's something that we could really learn from. Look at what Joseph did in all of this. And look at how the Lord led Joseph in all of this. So we can see a, a few things. I have four thoughts here. Jo First of all, Joseph didn't think it was evil to be involved with Pharaoh and the pagan Egyptian government. He didn't think it was evil. There are some Christians that think that way. 
And if they think that way, that's fine, as long as they go according to their conscience. But he didn't think it was evil to be in this position. I can even imagine his own father came and blessed Pharaoh. Thinking, shouldn't he have rebuked Pharaoh? He came and blessed Pharaoh. So he didn't think it was evil to be in that position. And me, personally, I think it's a, a good thing for a Christian, for a believer, to, who feels like he should get involved with the government, whether at, at a local level, a state level, a federal level. I think it's a good thing for Christians to be involved because it helps in the decisions of that, of that nation and it helps other Christians in that nation as they seek to honor their Lord and to survive and, and to follow their Lord. So if a Christian wants to do that, that's a good thing. As long as that Christian does not compromise. And I would also add this, as long as that Christian thinks that what he's doing is what God wants him to do. As long as he feels like he's doing spiritual good there and he doesn't compromise, that's a good place for him to be in. Pray for that brother, pray for that sister. Pray for yourself if, if it's you. And also we need, to, we need to be mindful of this if, you know, we need to be careful, as I said, as long as that person doesn't compromise. But we got to be careful. Who are we to judge what compromise it is? We need to be careful there because we could say, did Joseph's father compromise in, in blessing Pharaoh? Did Joseph compromise and be in that, in that position? We'll say, well, no, we have it told to us clearly in the scriptures that the Lord had him there for a reason, for the Lord's purpose. But all through what he did, did he never compromise? I don't know, maybe not. We don't do everything perfectly. But I would say that it's a good thing for a Christian to be in places of government at any level, as long as they don't compromise and as long as they think that they're doing some spiritual good for the Lord in that place. We should feel that way about everything we do. Every area of work, everything we're given to, we should feel that that's what we're doing unto the Lord. And in whatever form of business we are in, we should feel like we're doing that to the Lord. So that's my first thought. He didn't think it was evil to be involved with Pharaoh and, and Egypt. Number two, as a believer in that position, Joseph responded to the question that I raised in verses 15 and 19, give us bread for why should we die in your presence? <clears throat> he responded to that question. He took it personally, that he needed to take care of these Egyptians. And he fulfilled what our, what our Lord taught, love your neighbor as yourself. The second great commandment, to love your neighbor as yourself is to do what? It's to care for those who are, who are needy and you're able to help them. And not just those who are needy, but to love everybody, the needy and the unneedy alike in whatever area and whatever station of life we are in, to show love to our neighbor. Third, as a believer in that position, Joseph, this is very interesting. Joseph did not give something for nothing. Again, this was not the United States welfare system. This was Egypt under the oversight of a believer. And he did not give something for nothing. Every time the Egyptians came for food, they had to pay for it. They had to give something for it. First their money, and then what? Their livestock, their land, eventually themselves. He didn't, give, he didn't give something for nothing. But as a godly man, ne Joseph never abused this, this authority. He never abused this privilege. He never took advantage of them. But again, he never gave something for nothing. And this is, a, this is a, a principle that we really can't exactly follow in forms of government because there are so many evil people in government who will take advantage of the people. In this case, these people just casted themselves at the mercy of the government. And thank God. Joseph saw to it that they were cared for, that they were taken care of. They had hoped to make it past that famine. The problem with governments giving something for nothing, as our nation does, is it, it tempts to laziness, and we see that in great ways. We see that in our own government. Giving something for nothing tempts people to laziness. It tempts people to have a, an unnatural dependence upon the government. I believe that even in our government, even pagan governments, to give to the needy, that's a good thing. I'm not opposed to that. But of course, we need to see who those are who are truly needy. And to give to those who are needy for long periods of time, I'm not opposed to that. But of course, you need a way of the people are truly needy. Of course, that, that, that's a difficult situation to try to unpack and try to understand. That's why it's easy to say I'm not in government. 
but we can see the errors of what governments do. Joseph was a believer in this position. I, I, do, I do need to say this here, you know, this principle that I'm bringing up, the fact that he, he didn't give away something for nothing, right? Being part of the government. We cannot relate that to how we give as Christians and how Christian churches are to give as Christian churches because they are not in this civil, unchristian form of government. Jesus told us to give far differently than that. Jesus never told us, don't give something for nothing. That's not what our Lord commanded us. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 42, Jesus said, give to him who asks you and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. So what is the condition to give to a needy person according to our Lord? He asks you. It follows the principle where our Lord said, you, you have not because you ask not, speaking of prayer. So when it comes to Christian giving, Jesus tells us, give to those who ask you. It's a similar principle in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 27 and 28, which says, Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due, when it is in your power or in the power of your hand to do so. Do not say to your neighbor, go and come back, and tomorrow I'll give it, when you have it with you. If you're able to help and the Lord shows you a need, that's when we're responsible to, to tend to that need. Christians are called to freely give, and this is a good way to look at it. Christians are called to freely give until reasons show that they shouldn't. So we don't always follow this to a T, but Christians should freely give until reasons show that they shouldn't. Fourth, a fourth form of application we can make from this is that Joseph gave them an incentive to get out of their poverty caused by this famine. He gave them an incentive. He, he gave them seed freely from Pharaoh, and they were allowed to keep 80% of, of, of what they farmed. So this helped them to, know, to, to not continue to be dependent upon the Egyptian government. This helped them to get out of poverty. And as long as they used their skill, as long as they were determined, as long as they used their ability, as long as they worked and they were productive, they were allowed to keep 80% of it. So it, this wasn't a form of communism. This wasn't the union. Th this, this was where they were given an ability to, according to their own ability, according to their own productivity, their own endeavors, they were able to get past this famine and continue thriving as, Egyptian, as an Egyptian nation. So those who worked hard, those who were skillful, those who were diligent in this, well, they did well. And they could do well for their families. This is a wonderful incentive to get past this famine, to get past this time. So that's all I want to say about the Egyptians. But I do want to make a, I do want us to see that I think the Lord makes a distinction between these Egyptians and his people. The Egyptians and, and, and the Lord's people, the Israelites, they both went through the famine. They both experienced the same famine. They both experienced hardship. I, this hardship that Israel experienced was the very reason that he sent his sons to Egypt to go and, fi and find food, to go and buy food, because they were going through this hardship. Uh, we, we can remember what, what they were saying. Why should we die? We, we need to do something. We need to find food. But there is a distinction in how they went through this famine. In two verses prior to our text, verses 11 and 12, it says this, And Joseph situated his father and his brothers and gave them a possession in the land, and the best of the land, and the land of Ramesses, as Pharaoh had commanded. Then Joseph provided his father, his brothers, and all his father's household with bread, according to the number in their families. So Joseph gave them bread, and it says he gave them land, and not just land, but the best of the land. We could say here, Joseph didn't follow that principle of not giving something for nothing. Joseph gave his family a whole lot for nothing. And we can apply that to how we treat other believers. We don't take advantage of any people, but especially when the person is a believer. We don't take advantage of them. Look at verse 27. It says, So Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt, 
and the country of Goshen. This was the best of the land, as it said. And they had possessions. They, they had possessions there and grew and multiplied exceedingly. So they didn't have to give up their possessions. They were going through the same famine that the Egyptians went through. But it says something far different about these Israelites. They grew, they were multiplying, they had possessions. This is similar to what Jesus asked Peter. From whom do the kings of the earth take customs or taxes? From their sons or from strangers? And what did Peter answer? Well, from strangers. And then Jesus said, then the sons are free. And here we see that Joseph's family was free. Why? Because they were Joseph's family. That, that, that's, that's all the condition that they needed to meet. They were Joseph's family. They were free. They didn't have to sell everything that, that they had, go into this harsh slavery. They didn't have to become Pharaoh's servants, all because they were Joseph's family. And Pharaoh let, let Joseph determine that. Remember every time that they came to buy grain, Joseph kept putting their money back into their sacks. He gave them the grain and he put their money back in the sacks. Yes, that was to test them, but it was also because they were his family. And he wasn't going to charge his family for what they needed, for their necessities. So there is a distinction that I see here between Egypt and Israel, between the worldly and the godly, the people of God and the people of the world. Jesus said, our Father in heaven makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. So our father, yes, he cared for pagan Egypt. He took care of them. He got them through the famine. He did care for them. They weren't treated harshly. But we look at how the Israelites were. They were doing far better. God showed that they were his people. They were cared for. And we can say, according to Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Because of Jesus, I have no lack. I have no need. In, in Christ, I have everything that I need. In Christ, I have everything that he satisfies me. He takes care of me. He provides for me. He helps me. He encourages me. He gets me through my struggles. He carries me through them. He helps me not to be utterly depressed and utterly cast down. He helps me not to fall away from him. He keeps me. That psalm continues to say, He makes me to lie down in green pastures. This is what our Lord does for us. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for His name's sake. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is what our Lord does for His people. And the Lord, another thing the Lord did with these with his people, with the Israelites, is he blessed the Israelites with children, a lot of children. Yes, they had to leave Canaan, beloved Canaan, and go to Egypt, but they were in a good place with God. How many of them left from Canaan to Egypt during the famine? 70, 70 something, somewhere around there. And then when they left, about 400 years later, there was a census taken. And in, in, in that census, in the Old Testament, it says that there were seven, they counted 600,000 men. And then when you add women and children, it was about over 2 million Israelites left Egypt to go back to Canaan in the book of Exodus. They multiplied, they grew exceedingly. The Lord had blessed them in, in every way, even to the point to where the, the, the Egyptians were scared of them. And that's the reason why they were putting them into this harsh form of slavery, because they were, they were, they were intimidated by them. They were scared of them. We read in Exodus 1, verse 7. We're almost done. Exodus 1, verse 7. But the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly, multiplied and grew exceedingly mighty, and the land was filled with them. So we see a distinction there. And then as we close, it says that the time came for Israel that he must die. And then Israel came to Joseph, his son, and he said there in verse 29, Please do not bury me in Egypt, but let me lie with my fathers. You shall carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burial place. Egypt is always going to be, be a picture of the world. And Canaan is always going to be a picture of heaven. It's always been that way. And in the same way that these Israelites were only in Egypt for a temporary time, and then they eventually went to Canaan, 
Christians today were only in the world for a temporary time and that we're going to go to heaven. And then even Israel, Jacob, Israel, he didn't even want his body to stay in Egypt. He wanted everything of his to go to the place where he was meant to be with his fathers, with his people in Canaan. And then this chapter ends saying, so Israel bowed himself on the head of the bed. <clears throat> he bowed himself on the head of the bed. This old man who had a very rough life, Jacob, now Israel, and rough life because of his own sin in so many ways, was now in a good place between God and man. He was ready to die. And we're almost at, his, at the end of his life. Next chapter, we're going to see where he blesses his grandsons. And in the chapter after that, he, blesses, he kind of blesses his own sons before he dies. Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the scriptures.